Our scripture reading today comes from Luke 18, 35 to 42. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd go by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. This is the reading from the Word. Well, good morning. It's great to be with you all again. I am back from Mexico. Ole. So we had a great wedding time down there, and uh, I think we're still exhausted from all the flight and the kids and everything else going on here today. But uh, it's good to be back with you. Uh, before we get to the sermon proper today, uh, we do have something special to do. And it is both with a great joy and a, and a great sadness to uh, have to do this today. And uh, if you didn't, haven't heard, but uh, our Office Administrator Joy, who is sitting with us today, will be leaving. Uh, and if you haven't heard that news, I know you're heartbroken. Uh, I didn't do anything, just so you know. No, <laughs> uh, no uh, Joy is here today. And Joy, I'm going to have you come up if you don't mind. Come on up and uh, be here with us. Yeah. <laughs> so we wanted to take a moment to recognize you. Uh, Joy, I asked her if she wanted to speak. She said no. So I'm going to tell her, tell you all what she's doing. <laughs> Right, you read the newsletter, but Joy is actually going to be going uh, to Madison Christian, uh, the school there, and she's going to be uh, going to be an office administrator uh, person uh, there, and it's really good news because she's wanted to do this for a long time, and she also has uh, her daughter there that uh, will be very special to be part of her life in a little bit more intimate way than it is now. So uh, we are just so happy for you and so excited for you. Uh, we do have a gift for you, so I want to give that to you now. Hopefully you brought your workout arms today. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. And we do have a, a little card for you that Thank as you. well. So, yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> Thank you very much. I yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> and if you want to... Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Don't leave, don't leave. Don't leave yet. So I know I speak on behalf of this church to say that, yeah, I know it's heavy. You're going to have to hold it there. It's a workout for the day. But uh, I want to know uh, for this whole church, we do want to just say thank you for all the work that you have done. You have been an amazing person. I've mentioned this to you personally, so I know I can share it with everybody, but Joy has been the best office administrator I've ever worked with. Uh, and it was too short of time. <laughs> yeah, she pay, paid me good money to say that. But uh, we were going to miss you tremendously, uh, but we have just enjoyed our time together. It was a fruitful season, and we know that God has great things for you and your family as you go forward. Uh, we'd love to send you with a prayer as you leave us. Yeah, so let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much uh, for Joy and her family, what they've meant to this church. And Lord, uh, all the different memories of the things that had to get planned, things that had to be organized, uh, people, Lord, that came in uh, that Joy was able to, to touch and to, to bring a special uh, joy to their life. May you bless her as she goes on this next endeavor. May you always guard her and her family. May this be a joyous occasion. May you open up every opportunity and every door for her to minister to this community uh, through her new position. So Lord, we love you and praise you. And uh, we, again, even though we're sad, we are thankful for the time that we've had. And we also are thankful uh, for the path that you have laid before joy and what you're going to do through her and her family. pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so Joy uh, is going to be in and out of the office this week, so uh, if you did want to just say a special thanks, come by and say hi to her, feel free to do that uh, here this week. Uh, she's going to be with us just this week. <laughs> uh, for those uh, that haven't been with us, welcome again. Uh, we are actually starting a new sermon series, so you haven't missed anything, and it's a very, very short sermon series. In fact, it's two weeks, so you're going to get... 
half of it today. And I had this really, really cool slide that I worked really hard. No, uh, there was a little graphic, and the name of this sermon series uh, is called Sycamore. And you go, that's a really odd name for a sermon series, and it is. And in fact, at the end of today, you're still not going to understand why it's named Sycamore. You've got to come next week, because that's my little cliffhanger, just so you know it's coming. You're going to be like, I don't get it, I don't get it. And then next week, you're going to go, ah, I get it. And so uh, we're going to be looking at these two weeks of two stories where Jesus interacts with people in a very powerful way. And so let me pray as we get started. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, like I said, there's two stories, and they're actually closely linked together. And in our scripture, you don't really get that idea of it when we kind of just read through it, but actually, they're very, very closely linked. And the first one is the one that we just read through scripture. It's a story about a blind man. And if you haven't known the context of the story, I just want to give some of it to you. This is pretty far into the Gospel of Luke when we read the story here today. In fact, it's it's the very end of chapter 18. It's right before Jesus is going up to Jerusalem and right before the Passion narrative and everything else that happens in the Gospel of Luke, uh, right before we lead up to the week of Passion and also the cross and resurrection. And so Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and there were different ways to get there. Uh, there's a main way that took you through Samaria, but they didn't like to go that way because Samaria was not exactly the nicest place to be, and it was also a people group that weren't exactly Jewish. <laughs> they kind of were, they kind of weren't, they kind of were, if you were hung out too long with them, you ended up sort of, oh, did we get, ooh, <laughs> yes, ah, see, and you got, I've, I've, I trained you last time to do that, right, where it's, it comes up in every new sermon series, you're like, yes, ah, and you're probably wondering uh, what's going on there, and, and just keep that image of the road in mind uh, as we go through these sermon, these two weeks. But uh, you know, Jesus is he's heading up to Jerusalem, and he chose to go the out, the the way that's called out of the way. And when you did that, you kind of went down towards the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, and you would actually have to make a pit stop in Jericho. And why did you have to make a pit stop in Jericho? It's because it was at the bottom of the mountain that leads up to Jerusalem. And not only that, but this mountain is chalk. If you ever go there, when you ever read the scripture, Jesus was in the wilderness, don't think trees, and birds and stuff. Think desert, like flat out mountainous desert. It's not a good place to be, right? There's no water source. There's no shade. There's no anything unless you find a cleft in the rock. And so uh, Jesus, it's the last pit stop. It's kind of like when I was uh, uh, graduated from high school, me and my best friend at the time, we decided, hey, Let's make a road trip. And so we decided to go see as many of the national parks we could do in one or two weeks, that was. And so we took off from Atlanta and we drove the southern route, kind of came back the northern route uh, through and saw a whole bunch of stuff. But I remember distinctly, we got to Utah. And you remember if you get to Utah and you're coming through kind of north part of it, kind of trying to get to Yellowstone and the Tetons and all that, there's this part where you go through like the salt flats. You guys, some of you are shaking your head. You've been there, right? All right, and there's nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing. And there are these signs, right? Because there's a lot of travelers, you know, that are like us. They're like, oh, we're good. We, there's going to be something along the way. And there's signs that warn you over and over again. This is the last stop, right? <laughs> if you get past the stop, you got 200 miles before the next gas station. There is nothing. Stops to get gas. You know, it's just flashing lights almost saying stop, stop, stop. And of course, if you don't, you're in trouble. And so this is what Jericho is if you come this way to Jerusalem. If you come up and you don't stop in Jericho, refresh yourself, there's no more refreshment until you get up all the way up top of the mountain through the desert heat and through the, the, the coarse, kind of chalky, sandy stuff, all the way up to the very top of the mountain where you finally get some of that rainfall that has some shrubbery and stuff like that. And so this is the place you're supposed to come and stop. Well, in this story, it's kind of interesting because before Jesus gets to Jericho, it says there's a crowd around him. Now, this is kind of one of those funny things. In my head, I'd always grown up uh, thinking there's just a crowd following Jesus at this moment. And that's kind of true. There's probably some that are doing that. But actually, in ancient uh, culture and also even in the Middle East today, uh, when someone famous comes to town, it's common for the people to go out and meet that person. One of my uh, favorite authors is uh, Kenneth Bailey. He's passed away now, but he tells a great story. He's lived in the Middle East a lot of his life and uh, a great commentator, Uh, one of my People I'll quote very, very often if you haven't heard my sermons. I, I quote them quite often. 
But he was telling a story of this in modern days. He said they lived in Egypt in 19, uh, 1960. And he said the president at the time was coming to town. And so the people went 10 miles outside the town to meet the president. And then they, they convinced the president and all his entourage to turn off their car engines. They tied ropes to the cars and pulled them into town because it was a way of showing honor and esteem to that person. Uh, and if you've ever been in some other cultures, this isn't totally common to, or totally uncommon in other places, but very, very common in the Middle East. And so what's actually going on here is most of this crowd are people from Jericho leaving Jericho to come out to meet Jesus and like an entourage come back into town. And there would have been a feast prepared for him that he was expected to go to. There would be a place uh, for him to go and be honored and all these type of ideas. Now what's interesting about that is uh, you guys are familiar with this concept, right? Uh, can't really mention the Browns or the Bengals, but, or really the Indians or the Reds anytime recently, right? But you guys do have the Cavaliers. And you remember when they won the championship, you guys, I know it's been a while and there's been some heartbreak since then, but by the way, are you guys like, did you guys burn the jersey or did you, you guys okay with LeBron or not okay with LeBron? I've been wondering about that. You know, is he cool? Is he not cool? I don't know. Anyways, so, right, when, but when they won and they came in, what happened? Everybody met them. There was this grand parade and, and kind of like brought them into this place of honor where they had sort of the commemoration and the lifting of banners and all the telling of stories. Same idea. Exactly same idea. Come out, Jesus, the great healer. He's coming into town. The great prophet, the great person that we're wondering who he is. Is he the Messiah? Let's go out and greet him. Let's bring him into town. And so this is a parade of honor, if you will. This is Jesus. You know, they're coming out. Everybody's clapping him on the back. Everybody's saying, yeah, you do it. You do it, Jesus. And so they're coming in and he's having, you know, Jesus is having this moment. And the story, Luke, uh, and if you haven't ever understood Luke um, about him, he's a very... uh, detailed person. And it's very interesting to compare this story to the story that's told in Mark, because the same story is told. And Mark gives a few more details that Luke leaves out, which is normally not the way it happens. Normally it's all the opposite. And for instance, Luke calls this man the blind beggar. When well, Mark, we learn his name. And his name is Bartimaeus. Now I want to just apologize real quick. If your name is Bartimaeus, don't tell anybody right now, because how that translates is son of filth, right? Son of filth was this guy's name, the blind beggar. And he's sitting not in the town, he's sitting on the road to the town in a very public place where people who are passing up to go to Jerusalem for the different festivals and different things would have to come by and they would have to see him and they'd either act out of compassion or they would just walk by. And so in this story, when the beggar is sitting there outside the city, your heart should break. And I guess Luke, maybe he was too compassionate, or maybe he just didn't know the details, but for some reason he doesn't mention the man's name. He just calls him the blind beggar and leaves it at that. But this man is sitting there and been presumably blind his whole life, and Jesus comes and he calls out. Now just imagine the uproar of the crowd, the celebratory feeling, the people patting him on the back, go Jesus, you know, probably chanting, Jesus, Jesus, yeah. <laughs> right? And, and this blind beggar calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You remember what the people do? They shush him. <laughs> shh, shh. Stop it, blind beggar, get back, you know. And, and actually in the gospel mark, it says a little bit, again, more profoundly than Luke, but they they say in Luke, you know, shut up, but in Luke it's shut your mouth, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean, in Mark that is, shut your mouth. Like, put down, get down, blind beggar. This is his moment. Get out of the way. And what does the blind beggar do? He begs even louder. And he cries out louder. And, I, and I've always wanted to see this kind of enacted in a church. You know, we, we do different stories. But I've never seen this one, actually, in, a, in like one of the Jesus plays or anything like that. Because I just imagine like the character having to play the blind beggar of yelling over the crowd at the top of your lungs, have mercy on... And I'm not going to do it really loud, you know, but have mercy on me. <laughs> like, whatever your interpretation, but I mean the core gut of who you are crying out to the Lord, help me. Now, there's kind of this interesting thing uh, that's going on here is beggars were different back then and even in Middle East today than they are now. And here's what I mean by that. 
our experience with the beggars is kind of like you're at the gas station and comes up and someone comes up to you and says, hey man, I'm uh, on a road trip and I'm trying to like, you know, go see something, something and get a job over here and so-and-so sick back home and I'm out of the job, you know, and, they, and then they ask for money for gas and then they don't put gas in their car and they drive off, right? Or you're walking down the street and someone asks you for, hey, I'm, you know, we'll work for food type of sign and you give them the 20, right? And then they, you know, they say, God bless you and then they turn around and they keep asking for money and you're like, I thought you wanted food, you know, but <laughs> that's kind of like our vision of what, you know, sometimes we experience people begging for money. Well, in the Middle East, it's weird to think about it this way, but here's how they thought about beggars. It was their job. And they were part of the community, a necessary part of the community, and they actually offered a service to the people. In a totally different way of thinking about it than we do, right? And here's what the service was. Was God had told people, take care of the poor, Right? And that's very clear. And so if you were a pious person, the expectation was is that when you would pass a poor person, you would stop and give some alms. The reward you got for that is the beggars were always at a very public place. And so what would happen was is if you were there and you were a blind beggar, you had it good because you were blind. Everybody had to give. I mean, if you're a pious person, you can't walk past the blind beggar. Right? You've got to stop and give some money. And so if you were there, his service is not, hey, I'm hungry, please feed me. The service that he's offering is, hey, this is your chance to prove how pious you are, how much you love God. So as Americans, it's just a totally different way of understanding what, what is going on here. But it was sort of his position in society to be the person that other people could show not only their own, you know, love of God and things like that, of following the scripture, but also what would end up happening is, is when you would give alms to the poor, here's what would happen. And again, you're in the public square normally or something like that where lots of people are around. The beggar would then say, oh, bless you, most holy person. You are the righteousness of the sun and you are glow and may you just go in and out and never have any... I mean, this is Middle East. This is how it works, right? I mean, it goes on and on and on. And you get... You sound like you just cured cancer, right? I mean, <laughs> like, you, this is the blessing that you get. Which, again, when Jesus, remember when he's teaching the Sermon on the Mount, he says, when you give alms to the poor, don't announce it with trumpets. Don't go, just go and give. Don't even let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Do it in secret. Now what he's saying there, he's hyperbolizing, right? He's not saying like if someone sees you give it, it's meaningless. That's not what he's saying. He's saying in those cultures, it was the thing to do. Announce with trumpets, announce your holiness, announce your goodness to everybody. Give your little, no, your little coins to the blind beggar. And everybody goes, oh, what a good person, right? What a good person. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. That's not what it's about, right? And in the Sermon on the Mount, he totally changes that idea. Well, this is what's going on here. This blind beggar, this is his, his source of income, his only way of doing things, his service to the community, his whole identity is wrapped up in being the person that people show their piousness to. But when Jesus comes, what does he ask for? Now, it's obvious to us, right? Because we think, well, he wants his sight back. He's blind. Obvious. Duh. But think about what happens. If he receives his sight, what happens? In a world where you are from a little boy trained in your job, you're apprenticed in it, and you're very specific in what you do, and you've trained your whole entire life to be the blacksmith, to be the, the... the woodworker, to be the stonemason, to be the, you know, person that does the agriculture, that does the weaving, that does whatever it is that you've learned to do, this guy hasn't had it. And so think about that for a minute. He asked Jesus, not for alms, he asked for his sight. In fact, there's this poignant part of the story, right, where finally he says, you know, he's crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And above the crowd, they've tried to shush him. He yells, son of David, have mercy on me. Right? And I, I kind of laugh saying that, but you know what I'm saying? Like, there's no way of overdoing that. Like, whoever overacts, that's their position. They need to play this part because you can't overact the heart of this person. And he cries out, and Jesus, it says, stops. It's pretty profound in the first place, isn't it? Kind of like that image. He's supposed to follow the crowd go to his banquet that's prepared for him in Jericho, be the center of the celebration, but he stops. And he really kind of does a U-turn, doesn't he? I'm going to go see this blind man. And he calls the people that have shushed him. And he says, hey, 
go grab them and bring them to me. Now think about that too, because the people that were shushing them all of a sudden now have to be the man's servants. Kind of a nice little twist. Jesus kind of does those little things every now and then. But <laughs> anyways, he brings the, they bring the blind man, right? And Jesus asks this question, and to you and me it seems so heartless, but it's not at all. He says, what do you want me to do for you? And when I read the story as a you know, 21st century American, it's like, well, Jesus, duh, heal him, right? You know, like, <laughs> Jesus, why ask the question? Just heal him, right? But think about that. If Jesus heals him, it's maybe a free act of God to this person's life, but it doesn't come easy, does it? There's a whole lot of responsibility. If this man's healed, his whole way of life has to change. He doesn't get to be the blind beggar anymore. He's got to actually figure out how to make a living and he has every card stacked against him because he's never learned the ways and the tools of whatever profession he would need to be to make money. And so Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And those words are so powerful. He just says simply, Lord, I want to see. And then Jesus' words are so efficient, they say, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. And immediately the sight returned and he followed Jesus praising God. And then all the people saw it and they also praised God. What is kind of the theme, one of the underlying themes of this sermon series is this amazing part that God doesn't leave us the same when he blesses us, does he? And in fact, in this series, you know, like when Jesus comes and meets this blind man, he's the oppressed person, if you want to say it that way. I mean, he is the down and out person. He's the person missing from the table. He's the disenfranchised, if you will. He's the person that no one wants to be around, no one's friend, no one's whatever. And yet Jesus stops and heals him. But at the same time, there's a great cost from that, isn't there? But this man knows what's more important. And he'd rather receive the blessing from Jesus and give, be given all this responsibility than to simply stay the blind beggar and get some alms. And Jesus in this moment has great compassion, but he also has a great challenge for this man. This man's life is never going to be the same. And in fact, not only did Jesus do a U-turn in this moment, it's actually this man, this blind man, his whole life is now a U-turn as well. And the thing about it is, is when we pray and God answers our prayers and God enfolds us into His love and God transforms our lives and does all these things, it's free, isn't it? But it's not cheap. It's free, but there's some requirements on the other side, isn't there? And when Jesus transforms us, it's not okay for us to keep the same life, to do the same things, Jesus transforms us and changes us to praise God, to follow Him. And there may be a whole bunch in our life that has to change as well. We're going to continue this sermon series next week and you're going to understand the idea of sycamore a little bit better. But once again, Jesus is here today. And as we come to this communion table, know that everybody's welcome to come. Everybody, you don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to be a member of this denomination. If you want to receive Jesus Christ, you come today and receive him. And let's let you know there's going to be an opportunity to take a piece of the bread, uh, to rip it off and uh, place it in the cup and just take, partake in communion that way. But God is going to bless us here in just a moment. But when you come, know that God may answer your prayer, whatever you're seeking. But know there may be some effects to that later. And the question is, are you going to follow Jesus Christ and praise God? Or do you just want the quick fix and walk the other way? Let us pray. Lord, as we're here today, we thank you for your love. And we also thank you, Lord, that you don't just leave us abandoned, but Lord, you do challenge us. And so we, your people, come to this table here today, not only to profess that, God, you have done this great work in us by giving us new life through Jesus Christ and offering yourself up for us, but Lord, each and every day you empower us with the Holy Spirit to live as you would have us live. To live not of this world, to not follow its desires, to not play by its rules, 
but Lord, to live as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so as we're here today, Lord, we gladly, like that blind man, come to you. And we ask for the greatest healing that we can have, the healing of our souls. And we know, Lord, that even though it's freely offered, that it doesn't come cheaply. That when we accept that freedom, that love of you, there is a response. And the response, Lord, is to praise you and to live our lives all for you and all your glory. So as we're here today, Lord, may you bless these elements. May on that night when you took the bread, sat with your disciples, and you broke the bread and you gave it to your disciples, you said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Lord, you took the cup and you gave thanks and you gave it to your disciples. You said, take this and drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of my new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And so Lord, as we remember your passion narrative, your mighty acts, we do pray for these elements to be your body and blood. that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ. That Lord, you would transform us. And that, God, we would accept the responsibility of being your children and living the life you called us to live. So, God, we give you all honor and glory and praise here today. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to ask now the communion stewards to come forward to help. <clears throat>